Welcome to the Stoa. The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. I'm Maybe Gray. Welcome to the Stoa. The Stoa is a digital campfire where we can cohere and discuss what's on the knife's edge of what's happening now. I've been hosting a series of Q&As called uh, Raw Sexuality uh, on topics that are sensitive and taboo in our culture, hoping to uh, start some radically honest conversations that we might not otherwise have. And today I'm here with Chester Brown, who is uh, the writer and illustrator of Mary Wept Over the Feet of Jesus, which I think has a, a radically honest reinterpretation of some of the norms around sexuality in our culture, um, specifically from the Bible. Um, <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I, I can hear my boyfriend laughing at me again through the wall and it always makes me chuckle. Chester, um, I was wondering if you could start us off by telling us a little bit about what inspired you to write Mary Wept Over the Feet of Jesus. Um, okay, many years ago, but I mean, I've, I've had an interest in Christianity for a long time. I, I was raised religious. I was raised in a, in, a, in a home where, you know, we went to church every Sunday and, um, and then, uh, and you know, I, I, I was a believer, uh, although, you know, in my teenage years, I went through a, que a questioning phase. Um, but then in my early 20s, I started reading um, books uh, of biblical scholarship uh, and got really fascinated uh, with that and began reading the Bible really seriously. And um, then I, de I decided, uh, you know, I, I got a, a comic book, a publisher hired me to do a comic book series and I could basically do whatever I wanted in it. And so for part of it, I decided I'm super interested in the subject of the, you know, religion, Christianity, the Gospels. Why don't I do um, an adaptation of the, of the Gospels? And so I started with the Gospel of Mark, uh, which was the earliest of the Gospels. And um, so I was, and that made me focus even more on reading uh, works of biblical scholarship. And so uh, this would have been the 1980s when I was doing this. And uh, sometime in the 80s, I think around 87 or 1988, a book was published um, by this biblical scholar named Jane Schaberg. Uh, the book was titled The Illegitimacy of Jesus. And Jane Schaberg's uh, contention was that uh, the Virgin Mary uh, uh, had not been a virgin, that, that uh, she had been raped and that Jesus was the result of that, that rape. And I read that and I was like, yeah, that makes more sense than the story that she was a virgin. So I pretty much just accepted uh, Jane's uh, proposal. And... Um, um, and then, and uh, just uh, and and by the way, the illegitim the illegitimacy of Jesus is a great book. Uh, even though I now disagree with some of the conclusions in it, uh, I I mean, if you're into biblical scholarship, it, like everyone should be reading that book. Um, but so um, so, like I said, I accepted her conclusions and um, and uh, went on with things. And then um, years later, uh, 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 totally unrelated, I started uh, visiting prostitutes, started, uh, started paying for sex. And um, that got me interested in, you know, uh, stories about prostitutes. And uh, I was already into the Bible, so biblical stories about prostitutes. And now going back to Jane Schaberg, Part of her reason for believing that um, uh, 
uh, that Jesus had been illegitimate, that Mary had been raped, was this genealogy in the Gospel of Matthew. In that genealogy, um, now, uh, biblical genealogies usually just focus on men, like uh, uh, Adam gave birth to Seth, who gave birth to uh, Micah, who gave birth to whatever, I'm making up names. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a sequence of men. So such and such male begat, such and such male begat, such and such male. And the women are totally ignored. Like the mothers are not mentioned, usually, in genealogies. And Matthew's genealogy is different. It mostly focuses on men, but five women are mentioned in this genealogy. And the five women are, uh, let's see if I can remember them off the top of my head, uh, Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, uh, Bathsheba, and Mary, the Mary the mother of Jesus. Um, and so Jane Shadberg was like, why did Matthew uh, do this? Why did he mention five women and not other women in, in that genealogy? Uh, uh, and this is really strange because women are not usually mentioned in genealogies. And she said, um, she pointed out that the, the first four women are women who are somehow associated with um, doing something sexually unconventional um, outside of marriage. Um, Tam uh, Tamar had been, uh, had had sex for money with, with a man. Uh, Rahab had been a prostitute, uh, had had sex with multiple men. Um, Ruth had uh, seduced a man in order to get him to marry her. And Bathsheba, uh, now Bathsheba is the questionable one, but the, the, the way that Matthew probably would have seen it uh, is that Bathsheba uh, tempted King David into getting sexually involved with her. And so, so that would have been you know, premarital sex. Uh, some people make the argument that Bathsheba would have been, uh, could have been, she definitely could have been, a rape victim. Uh, so that's the closest to Jane Shabberg's theory. That, but anyways, Jane Shabberg was arguing that the inclusion of these four women in the genealogy meant that, um, that, uh, the Virg that Mary had been, was a rape victim. And I had accepted that initially. And at a certain point, I was like, no, only, only one of those women was a potential rape victim. Uh, the first three were not. Two of them were uh, uh, having sex for money. One of them, uh, you, you know, uh, was uh, deliberately seduced a man. And the fourth one, uh, Bathsheba, she might have been a rape victim, but it's more likely that Matthew, actually the, the author of the Gospel of Matthew wouldn't have been named Matthew, but I'm gonna call him Matthew just for convenience sake. Uh, Matthew probably did not see her as a rape victim. He probably saw her as a temptress. So, and that's probably, he was probably saying, the, these four women, um, they're connected to Mary. Like uh, Mary, got pregnant in a way that was similar to these four women. Um, so to me, it looked likely that Mary uh, had, um, had probably been a prostitute. Uh, what, uh, if, if we're supposed to connect the, those four women to Mary, uh, why would two women who uh, charged money for sex be in that list if prostitution wasn't the, the anyway. So uh, I concluded that, that that's what Matthew in, intended us uh, to see, that, that Mary was, he was, Matthew was intending to hint that Mary was a prostitute. Um, that's what it looked like to me. So um, I'm trying to think, where, when would I have come to that conclusion? Probably 
the early 2000s or something. And so I was thinking, oh, I should do a book about this. Um, but I couldn't think how to do it. So this idea was in my mind for many years that um, Mary was probably a prostitute and how do I turn that into a book? And, you know, I had other books to work on. So, uh, so that's how it started. That, that was the initial germ of the idea for the book. Um, so I don't know. I went on, went on a long time there. I, I, I don't know if you want to uh, ask. Um, yeah, or... I, I do have a follow-up question for that. I, uh, I'll point out here that we'll probably take a couple questions maybe back and forth between the two of us, but uh, within the next like 15 minutes here, open it up to questions from the chat. So I encourage anybody as questions come up to type them in the chat. Um, this is being recorded. So if you would prefer not to appear in the YouTube video, you can just indicate that you would prefer for me to read your question for you. But that being said, I'm curious, Chester, one of the things that you mention in uh, Mary Wept Over the Feet of Jesus is that M Matthew, uh, let's call him, uh, wouldn't have been able to just come right out and say that, that Mary wasn't a virgin. And I wonder uh, what you see as the reasons in the past and in the present, why people would want to present Mary as either um, immaculate and pure or as wronged rather than having made it, like some sort of choice with her sexuality. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, I mean, the, the, the very idea that Mary was a virgin um, I don't think, and, and this was also another, uh, one of the things that, um, Jane Schaberg, uh, contended was that the idea that Mary was a virgin is not a biblical idea. She argued that it's nowhere in the Bible. It's not in Matthew and it's not in Luke. Um, uh, um, that it wasn't, Matthew or Luke or, it, or any of the biblical writers who contended that she was a virgin. It was the readers of uh, Matthew and Luke early on who didn't want to accept um, the obvious implication of the story that Matthew and Luke, incidentally Luke is, uh, is another of the, of the gospel. Uh, the, the, I mean, there are four gospels, four, four books in the Bible that basically tell the story about Jesus Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so the, the two stories that tell, the sto that tell about um, uh, the birth of Jesus, uh, that tell the story about Mary and uh, Joseph, the, the, you know, the, the two people who raised Jesus, um, those come from Matthew and Luke. Um, and yeah, uh, if you really examine them, neither of them says that Mary was a virgin. It's, it's people, early Christians, didn't want to accept the implication that Mary got pregnant uh, by having sex with a man other than Joseph, the man she eventually married, uh, and that she was having, that she had at least, had to have had sex with at least one man outside of wedlock, you know, prior to marrying Joseph. Uh, the, the early Christians didn't want to accept that, so they invented this story about uh, the virginity of, of Mary. And it's difficult now for people reading those stories to see that. They um, read Matthew and Luke and kind of project um, that idea onto them, project the idea that... that uh, and, I mean, there are reasons for that, uh, say, in, in Luke. Um, uh, the first time I think Mar uh, Mary is referred to in the story, she is referred to as a virgin. Um, but just saying that she's a virgin uh, when she's introduced into the story doesn't mean she stays a virgin uh, and that she is still a virgin after she uh, becomes pregnant with Jesus. And actually, if you read Luke, after she gets pregnant, she is never again referred to as a, as a virgin. So, and it, you know, it's, it's similar in Matthew. Um, so, um, both Matthew and Luke were trying, were being coy, like they didn't want to, 
they didn't want to emphasize what was going on, uh, you know, that Mary had sex with some other guy other than Joseph, but they made it pretty clear that she didn't. And um, so they're kind of, because they were coy about it, because they didn't want to be too, they, they were trying to uh, indicate that Mary had God's, that God approved of the birth of Jesus um, without emphasizing too strongly what, how Mary actually got pregnant. Like, um, they wanted to take the emphasis off that, but they didn't want to. It's, now what I think, I didn't actually put this in the book, but now what I think is going, because I was wondering, why, um, why would they admit, okay, in the case of Matthew, why would he even want to hint that Mary had been a, 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 a prostitute? If he was embarrassed about it, why just, why, why include that information in the genealogy? Why not um, um, uh, not deal with it at all? Maybe even skip the birth of Jesus or, or, uh, or whatever. Um, and so uh, if I was writing the, the Matthew chapter now that I, in, in Mary wept over the feet of Jesus, um, I, would, I would change it. Um, the reason why I think they hinted at it was because too many people knew. I suspect that what was going on, okay, Matthew and Luke, they, they weren't the first gospels. The very first gospel is the gospel of Mark. And Mark, uh, there's no birth of Jesus story in there. And uh, barely, he barely discusses the mother of Jesus. Uh, and I think now what, what happened is that people were making fun of the early Christians. They were saying, yeah, you, you can't even admit, like you wrote this, you, had, you wrote this book, the Gospel of Mark, and you had to ignore the, the birth of Jesus because you were embarrassed about uh, the, his mother. And I think that forced um, Matthew and Luke to at least deal with the, the birth to, to some degree, to, um, to admit that there was, that, that uh, Mary had not gotten pregnant uh, by having sex with Joseph, uh, that she got pregnant out of wedlock prior to being with Joseph. And uh, I think they were kind of forced to admit it. Uh, and, but they kind of skipped over that information. Uh, they included the information, but, but dealt with it in such a way that they didn't have to, uh, yeah, they were, as I said, they were being coy about it. And, uh, so now that's what I think uh, was going on, that, that they were forced to it by, by the critics of Christianity. Um, and then because they weren't explicit, they, because they didn't say exactly who got Mary pregnant, when and how and where, um, uh, then, then subsequent Christians were able to read the, that story as being the story about a, a miraculous virgin birth. Um, I, I, I think it's really fascinating how you understand Jesus and his life in light of knowing about his own birth and that it was like socially frowned upon in some way. Could you speak a little bit about that? Um, yeah, there's, uh, um, I, I think Jesus did I, I mean, there are several hints about this elsewhere in early Christian writings. Um, in the Gospel of John, for instance, Jesus gets involved in a, a debate with um, some, uh, some people who apparently disagree with him. And um, they're kind of trading insults back and forth. And at one point, um, these, these, I think they're Pharisees or Jewish scribes or something. Um, they, they, uh, they say something like, uh, our mothers weren't 
weren't prostitutes. And prior to this, there'd been no discussion about anyone's mothers or anyone being a prostitute. So why did they bring it up? It seemed to be uh, a hint that, uh, that, that Jesus had been, a, his mother had been a prostitute. So I, I, I obviously, and, and there's a similar thing in the gospel of, uh, there's a similar reference to the gospel of uh, Thomas, um, where uh, it, uh, it, it says something about, um, I'm trying to think, I can't remember the exact wording, but it refers to uh, it, it, that G Jesus was the son of a whore or something like that. Um, so, um, uh, so I think Jesus grew up uh, knowing about his mother's uh, background and, and knowing that she had been a prostitute. And I think this resulted in him uh, you know, there are all, there's already a belief, um, and there are certain in, in indications in, like, there's, there's a, uh, a, 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 a saying in the Gospel of Matthew where, uh, um, Jesus says, you know, prostitutes are getting into heaven ahead of you, and he's talking to, again, I think Pharisees there, um, or Jewish elders, um, which seems to, anyways, um, so, so there's already this idea that people have that Jesus uh, was tolerant of prostitution and that he was forgiving of them. And I don't, I think it goes beyond that. I don't think he just uh, had, I don't think he just tolerated um, them. I think um, there was something else going on. And that's, that leads to uh, another chapter in um, uh, Mary wept over the feet of Jesus. Um, I came across uh, an alternate version of one of the um, parables of Jesus, uh, the parable of the talents. Um, and now in this parable, in the biblical version of of the parable. It's a story about a rich man who's going away uh, on a trip and he, um, he uh, calls his three most trusted slaves to him. And he says, I'm going away on this trip, uh, but I want you to take care of my money while I'm gone. So, um, and uh, I'm, I'm gonna give, um, uh, I'm trying to remember the, the, the amounts. I think it was five talents to my most trusted slave, uh, three talents to my second most trusted slave, and one talent to uh, my third mo most trusted slave. And I want you to take care of the money for me while I'm away. And uh, when I come back, um, and I'll go I'm going to come back sometime a year or two from now. And so uh, while he's away, uh, the two most trusted slaves, they both invest the money and they double the money. And the, the one who's less trusted, the one who only got one talent, he takes that one talent and buries it in the ground and thereby uh, keeps it safe. And so when the master comes back, uh, the, the two most trusted slaves are able to say to the master, we doubled your money and uh, so the master's happy with them, and the slave who buried the money, uh, he, um, uh, the, the master is very unhappy with him, and he's, he um, uh, says, you know, get out of my sight. And this has always puzzled Christians because it makes it look like Jesus is super concerned about money and investing money and doubling your money which totally contradicts everything that Jesus says, you know, elsewhere in the gospels where he's like, don't be concerned about money. Like don't, uh, you, you shouldn't worry about these sorts of things. Um, so, um, uh, I was, I was reading a book, uh, I think in 2014, I was reading a book about, um, the parables of Jesus. 
And so it was by, the, the book was by this biblical, or uh, I don't think he's officially a biblical scholar. Well, he, he's a historian uh, and he's super interested in the Bible. Uh, this guy, John Dominic Crossan. Um, and so uh, uh, I believe the book's title is The Power of Parable uh, or The Power of Parables, something like that. Um, so in the section of the book where he's dealing with the parable of the talent, of uh, the talents, he mentions, and I had never heard this before, that there's an alternate version of this story, which was given by the early uh, church um, father historian, um, Eusebius, who if I'm remembering correctly, I think he lived around AD 300. Um, I hope I don't have that too wrong or too off, but anyway. Um, uh, so Eusebius said that uh, the earliest version, in the earliest version of the Gospel of Matthew, there's an alternate version of the uh, parable of the talents. And so um, in that version, uh, the, the, the rich master is going away. And again, he, in this version, he also calls his three most trusted slaves to him and says to, you know, uh, to the most trusted one, yeah, I'm giving you five talents to the second most trusted one, I'm giving you three and to the least trusted one. And then he goes away. But in this version of the story, um, the, uh, the most trusted one, well, um, Eusebius is, telling of the story is a bit unclear. So uh, who he gives the money to and who spends the money in which way is it's a bit muddled. Uh, but one of, the, one of the slaves spends all the money on prostitutes. And one of them uh, invests the money and doubles it. And again, one of them buries it and, uh, you know, just ends up uh, with just uh, the the one talent he was given, or the uh, what the amount that he was given, uh, and then when uh, the master comes back, he's very pleased with one of these slaves. He's not so pleased with uh, uh, another one, and he's uh, uh, he apparently again the uh, he's unhappy with the, the the slave who buried the talent. Um, and it's unclear, was he happy with the, with, the, uh, with the slave who spent all the money on prostitutes? That's how I think the story, there, I get into a large, uh, into a lengthy uh, discussion of why I think that this is the way that, the ma that Jesus originally told the story. That the master, when he comes back, he embraces the slave who spent all the money on prostitutes and he um, uh, uh, is less happy with the slave who doubled the money and he's least happy with, uh, with the, the slave who buried the, the, the talent. Um, and if I'm right, then it indicates that, G that Jesus... Um, didn't just tolerate prostitution, that he actually saw it as socially beneficial. I think that's what the, the parable is, is telling us. Um, and yeah, I give, uh, I'm not sure that it's that convincing when I'm telling it right now. Uh, I hope it's convincing in all my, in my lengthy end notes, why I explain why I think the master in the story embraces the 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 one who spent the money on pro on prostitutes, uh, but yeah, that's my main reason for thinking that Jesus saw prostitution as socially beneficial. I so enjoy your adaptation of the parable of the talents because I think it really um, gets at the exact intersection between um, prostitution and this sort of broader. Um, 
like reward for some sorts of religious disobedience like the idea that god or jesus aren't actually looking for us to like follow the letter of the law compared to the way that they're looking for us to like have faith and and try to have a good life for ourselves um i i think that um tyler's question um would be really interesting to move into from here tyler could you unmute yourself Yeah, sorry, I was washing no the dishes. Um, <laughs> uh, I was I was curious, Chester, how your relationship to Christianity has changed over time, whether you still consider yourself a Christian, maybe you consider yourself like a sort of almost alternate Christian who has a Christian adjacent belief system, but that includes things like sacred prostitution, uh, that set of questions. Yeah, I, I, I've, I, when I, when I first, became obsessed with reading about all this sort of stuff back in the 80s. Um, I was reading all this biblical scholarship that kind of, it's, it, it initially seemed to tear apart the Gospels and um, it, it made it difficult to continue to believe that, you know, the, the Gospels or the, the material in the Bible is the word of God uh, when you can, when you understand how it was all put together and everything. Um, so that kind of shook my faith uh, for a while. And I was um, for, a while, for a year or two, maybe longer than that, I was defining myself as an agnostic. Um, but um, it, it, then I started getting more into what is called uh, the Gnostic material. And um, that made more sense to me, that the idea that um, a sense of the divine was more, uh, that you got it more from in, inside yourself than from relying outwardly on sets of writings by other people. Um, now, since then, I've, I've, um, a biblical scholar named Karen King has sort of deconstructed the idea that there actually was uh, an ancient group called Gnostics. Uh, but of course, there were writings that, that, uh, that, that did later get defined or, uh, as, as, as Gnosticism. So I, I guess it's, well, it's, it's a contentious term. But anyways, uh, basically I'm saying I've found a way back into um, the, the religion. And um, so for a while I, I, was, I was back to considering myself religious and believing in God, but I was like, I don't have to define myself as a Christian anymore. Um, eventually, I decided why am, like I'm obviously obsessed with this stuff like I'm reading about Jesus all the time uh, and I believe there's a God uh, and this is my understanding of my like my understanding of God comes through the Christian stories, the parables, the um, the story about Jesus, um, the, uh, the 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 metaphors that are used in Christianity, the the the, the rituals. It's uh, like this this. Uh, if I'm so obsessed with it and I'm religious, uh, why not call myself Christian? Uh, one of the reasons why I shouldn't is because. I don't look like a Christian to so many Christians. Uh, my beliefs are so unorthodox, but like, why worry about that? Um, so these days, yes, I define myself as a Christian and I don't worry about uh, what, other, uh, what other Christians say. If other Christians don't wanna consider me a Christian, that's fine, uh, it's not a big deal, um, uh, yeah. Tyler, I see you have a follow-up question in the chat. I would love if you unmuted yourself again and asked that too. Yeah. Um, Jester, I was, I was curious, you know, one, one place I thought 
um, this talk might be leading is that you might have thoughts on how prostitution itself can be a spiritual practice. Not, not just the idea that in the Bible, you know, people like Mary might've actually been prostitutes, but that um, prostitution has a place sort of in, in religion. So I'd be curious to get your thoughts on that in religion or, or sacred practice. Yeah. Um, the, the, well, prostitution was certainly honored in lots of ancient um, religion, religions, particularly several of the, the goddess religions. Um, uh, after I uh, wrote uh, Mary Wept Over the Feet of Jesus, um, a translation of the, the texts devoted to uh, the ancient goddess Inanna came out. Um, I'm trying to think. Th they were translated by a Toronto writer. Um, I can't remember her name off the top of my head. A Kim something, I think. I'm, I, I'm, I apologize to her if, if she's probably not hearing this, but but um, but in in that in those, that translation of these you know, ancient texts devoted to this goddess, there are plenty devoted to, to prostitutes and, you know, extolling prostitutes and their, their role in society and how they benefit society. And, you know, it wouldn't have just been that religion. There were plenty of ancient goddess religions that, that, that honored prostitution. And I suspect that that's, what was going on, that Jesus was somehow related to that. Um, another part of Mary wept over the feet of Jesus is the sequence in the Bible where Jesus is um, uh, anointed um, by a woman. Um, and it's pretty clear uh, this is in all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and John, all have this scene where a woman anoints Jesus. And this is important because that's what the word Christ means. It means anointed one. Uh, that's what a Messiah was. A Messiah was an anointed one. And um, this is, in, in the Gospels, this is the only time that Jesus is anointed. He's and um, the, it's pretty clear, it's certainly in the Gospel of Luke, the, the woman is referred to as a sinner. And um, it, 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 everyone interprets that as, you know, Luke meaning that the, the woman was a prostitute. Um, and uh, I'm trying to think, I think in uh, Mark, uh, Mark and Matthew, they're not as clear, but it's it's this woman who who comes and anoints Jesus. But then the significant uh, gospel in this regards, in in regards to this story, is the Gospel of John, um, because in in John's recounting of the story. And again, John, the Gospel of John was not written by a guy named John, but I'm going to call him John. Uh, in John's version of the story, um, the, the woman who anoints Jesus is named, and her, her name is Mary of Bethany. And um, Mary of, and in this version of the story, um, Mary of, Mary um, has her hair uncovered. She's not referred to as a prostitute, but she has her hair uncovered. And this is not something women conventionally did at, at that time. In, in Jewish society at that time, women kept their, head, their hair covered because hair was seen as being erotically alluring. Like a woman who exposed her hair, it would have been the equivalent today of a woman, of a woman bearing her breasts. And a woman would not have done that in a ceremony like this. And it's, it's clear that her hair is exposed as she's anointing Jesus. Um, so it, it seems pretty clear she's a prostitute. The prostitutes were the women at that time 
who expose their hair. Um, and uh, so, so this dovetails with Luke calling her a sinner. Um, so uh, yeah, it, it seems pretty clear. And so why is Jesus being anointed by a prostitute? Um, unless this, this is, um, this r relates to, it, 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 I, it's my impression that Jesus was involved in a form of Judaism that honored not just the male god Yahweh, but also the female goddess Asherah. And there are references in ancient texts to Yahweh, the Jewish God, having a female consort named Asherah. Actually, there's some debate about whether Asherah is actually a name. There's also a debate about whether Yahweh is actually a name, but let's avoid all that. Uh, let's, we're we're going to call them, we're going to say that their names were at, uh, Yahweh and Asherah. Um, so I think Jesus was involved in uh, some sort of organization that had been, it had been a part of Judaism, although not formally acknowledged in the Jewish texts, but it had been uh, part of Judaism for centuries, I think. And, and I mean, it is acknowledged in the Jewish text to the degree that you can see that um, uh, a certain that the Jewish priests were constantly trying to purge uh, goddess wor worship from Judaism. And there's, there are lots of references to, um, to uh, worshipers of Baal being executed. And it seems obvious to me that these, this was a part of Judaism, that this was an internal war of sorts within Judaism. And the, the faction that wanted to say that, that wanted to define uh, Judaism as a monotheistic uh, a religion ruled over by one male God, that's the faction that won out. But it wasn't the only part, it wasn't the only uh, faction within Judaism, that there had been a faction that uh, was into goddess worship, that, uh, that honored uh, God as having both a male and female uh, aspect, is uh, perhaps a better way to say it. Uh, does that answer your question, Tyler? Maybe I got off topic. It was very interesting, but not exactly. Uh, I, I was sort of more interested in um, Chester's own personal views on oh. how uh, prostitution might be seen as a spiritual practice, like to, today in the world? Uh, well, I think every aspect of life can be seen as holy or religious. Um, like, I do, uh, I pay for sex. Um, I've, I've had a, a relationship with one particular sex worker for 17 years now, and uh when I'm with her, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a sexual experience, but it also is holy. It's, it's, uh, um, I try to honor it as the, the sex we have as being special. I mean, it definitely is special to me. And, and I see it as something that is, uh, uh, God given, uh, just like I try and see, I mean, I approach life from a religious perspective. I, I'm always trying to see, to experience uh, walking through life as if I'm walking through heaven. Uh, I see this realm as being very heaven-like while admitting that, you know, uh, there are aspects that uh, might not seem as heavenly, as, as so heavenly to uh, a lot of people. Um, I, I think it would be interesting to go to Jeff's question. It was earlier in the chat. So Jeff, let me know if you need me to like copy it for you to find it again. But if you remember it, you can unmute yourself and ask. 
Hey, yeah, I remember it. Um, I've been thinking before I read your book a lot about Jesus and like how his parents must have been badass. So on some <laughs> level. Um, and so when I got to that part of Matthew in your book, I had a very strong emotional reaction to it. And I liked it a lot. Um, uh, I'm sure you've gotten like lots of bad criticism since the book was written. Like my own mother was like, this guy's out to lunch. And <laughs> But uh, have you had any, like, you've already talked about a few, but I'm, like, really interested if, like, any good critical engagement since then that maybe, or uh, more things that have come up um, since writing the book, like, uh, uh, ideas that maybe people agree with you and, and uh, or disagree with you that maybe pushed the, the idea forward a bit more. Yeah, I guess, uh, I mean, you, you refer to, to um me talking about our earlier uh, experiences, uh, probably the one that you're thinking of is uh, like, I have a very close friend who is a Christian and she was, um, uh, I actually, when, when the book came out, I said, you know, maybe you don't want to read this book. Like this book isn't for everyone. Like we're good friends. Like I, I don't want to jeopardize our friendship. And um, she was like, no, 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 I really want to read it. And of course, then she read it and she was totally offended and upset with me. And, and um, um, but, but then she, she came around and, and um, uh, particularly uh, in the years since then, she has gotten involved in really, um, studying biblical scholarship and now she understands more uh, where, where, I'm, where I was coming from. And uh, now we're back to being very good friends. Uh, I, I saw her just yesterday. Um, and, um, but uh, you're probably thinking of, or asking about if there's been stuff since then. Um, I don't know, I mean, this is, relatively an, an old book by now. It came out in 2016. And so in the last few years, um, like, uh, uh, I, I still, I still go, go on, um, whatchamacallit, Goodreads, and keep up with the reviews that one sees there. And when the book first came out, there were all sorts of people who hated the book, as well as people who really loved the book. Um, and, uh, but that was in the, maybe the first six months or the first year of when the book was re released. And since then there continued to be people posting reviews. And for whatever reason, um, now it's getting almost exclusively positive reviews from people on, on a source like that. And I'm not sure why initially it was divided between negative reactions and positive reactions. Um, maybe that's because of the initial uh, publicity around the book. And so more people who uh, maybe have a religious nature uh, were encountering, hearing the book, about the book. And now it's more word of mouth readers. And so that that's maybe kind of a self-selection process that results in uh, just uh, uh, people positively encountering the book. But, um, but yeah, I haven't had a lot of uh, negative reaction in the last few years to the book. Um, Jacob, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Sort of. <laughs> um, so Chester, uh, regarding Christ's view of prostitution, uh, can we not say that we can discern his view of it based on his obvious reverence for the Mosaic law. So for example, <laughs> he constantly was upholding the law and referencing it, right? He would say, it is written, it is written, it is written. Have you not read? Have you not read? How does the law read? He was constantly referring to it. 
referring to it as his touchstone, right? Source of truth. In fact, even when he committed, when he performed healings, he would say, now go show yourself to the priest. So he was still encouraging adherence to the law, even right before he was about to abolish it. So it's impossible to read the scriptures from the Hebrew to the Greek without it being very clear how Christ feels about the Mosaic law. And the Mosaic law says in Leviticus, uh, do not profane your daughter by making her a prostitute. And then, and then there's another instance in Leviticus where it says something like, if the daughter of a priest profanes herself by prostitution, and then some sort of consequence is listed. So to me, it's like, how could Christ uphold prostitution uh, at the expense of the clarity where the law stands clearly on, on prostitution? Um, well, the, the problem with that is, did Jesus have reverence for the Mosaic law? Now, uh, if, if one, um, it's, it, that seems to be the case if one reads the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew is totally, he's, he's obsessed with the Mosaic law. And um, it's a big deal for Matthew to establish Jesus within Jewish history. And I mean, that's partly why there's that genealogy um, in Matthew. Um, and, and yeah, uh, but, but did Matthew get Jesus right? Um, I mean, this is a question right from the beginning of the, the Gospels. Uh, the first Gospel was the, gar the Gospel, as I've said, the Gospel of Mark. Uh, did Mark understand Jesus? Um, Mark, um, um, uh, th there's an odd thing about Mark, which is um, Mark, uh, presents the story of Jesus from the beginning of Jesus's ministry up until uh, Jesus's crucifixion, and a, you know a few days after that. Um, uh, uh, but Mark has this uh, odd take, uh, not just on Jesus, but on the disciples of Jesus. Mark is continually presenting the disciples of Jesus as being stupid, as not understanding Jesus's message. Um, this, is, uh, this is one of the big messages of Mark, which is uh, the, the, the apostles of, of Jesus didn't understand him. Um, who understands Jesus? Mark understands Jesus. Now, Mark never, never met Jesus. How likely is it that Mark understood Jesus better than the disciples of Jesus? I think, uh, Jesus uh, I think Mark had his particular understanding of who Jesus was, but his understanding was in conflict with the message that the disciples had. The, the, the disciples of Jesus were probably still alive uh, when Jesus, oh, I'm sorry, when Mark was writing his gospel. And um, so Mark, if he wanted his version of Jesus to be, under, uh, to be accepted, had to downplay the, the disciples of Jesus, had to say, these guys did not understand Jesus. They were stupid, they were idiots. Um, and so uh, that, uh, so that's, uh, so I'm, I, I really don't think Mark is conveying the, the genuine teachings of Jesus. Uh, I, th I think there's probably some genuine teachings of Jesus mixed in there, but uh, I think he's, um, uh, you know, pr presenting some, probably some stuff he's getting from Paul, who also never met Jesus, and uh, some stuff maybe he, get, he got from other sources. But um, he's definitely saying stuff that the disciples of Jesus weren't saying. Where, like he's contradicting the, the disciples of Jesus. Now Matthew, who is the, the uh, gospel writer who really stresses Jesus's reverence for 
the Mosaic Law, Matthew's gospel is a rewritten version of Mark's gospel. Um, so uh, we're, we're, uh, Matthew's gospel is, um, it, it's, it's a step removed it's, it's even one more step removed from Jesus, and it's based on a source that is unlikely to be faithful to the teachings of Jesus. Basically, that's what I'm saying. So how, how much reverence did Jesus really have for the Mosaic Law? I don't, I suspect he, he did respect it to some degree and, and did see the Mosaic Law as, as uh, doing, as, as being uh, an important part of, of Jewish tradition. Um, there is, what was it? He, he's talking about uh, divorce law. And he said, he, he talks about um, how uh, Moses uh, gave in to your de desire for, uh, for di di divorce, which is an indication that he thinks that um, the Mosaic law was, was not necessarily divinely inspired, that Mo Moses was inventing at least aspects of the Mosaic law. But and anyway, so that, that's, I you probably disagree, which is fine. We don't have to agree on everything. Well, it just seems like your answer is just simply, well, the record's wrong. And I think that's way too easy, way uh, too easy. But uh, thank you, thanks for your answer. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, Chester, are there any uh, final thoughts that you'd like to leave us with as we're just coming up on the end of the hour? Um, no, I, I, <laughs> nothing's coming to mind really. Um, yeah, every, everything. It, it's it's been a it's it's been a wow that hour went fast. It's been a, a very nice experience uh, doing this. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, it's been a great experience. I uh, am so excited to uh, get a little bit more uh, background on, on, on a graphic novel that I just enjoyed start to finish, especially uh, the religious scholarship in the back. Maybe if, uh, if Jacob were to read your full notes on uh, why you believe what you believe, he might feel slightly more persuaded. Um, I, I think if you guys like this Q&A, uh, you would have a lot of fun at a new wisdom gym event that we have coming up tomorrow with uh, Doug Tatarin uh, from his biomotive process. He's going to be doing a live demo um, of some emotional processing, uh, which I, I always find uh, working with Doug and watching w Doug work with others to be very like sacred and spiritual and lovely. Um, I'm just double checking. Sorry for my, my uh, unpreparedness. Uh, what time that is. Oh, uh, it's tomorrow uh, at 2.15 p.m. Eastern. So if you are free for this and your schedule looks the same tomorrow, you should be free for that. Um, also tomorrow we have uh, a session with Andrew Taggart and Daniel from Metagame Mastermind uh, called The Philosopher is Present. Um, Andrew is going to be sitting in and asking uh, questions to people in the audience. So it's going to be a Q&A, except the cues are coming your way this time. I think that'll be really fun. I think it'll be a fun inverted format. So definitely check that out as well. That's tomorrow at 6 p.m. Eastern. And again, thank you so much, Chester, for being here. Um, the STOA is a gift. So if you are inspired to give a gift in return, you can always visit the stoa.ca slash gift. Um, and make sure you check out uh, Mary Wept Over the Feet of Jesus and also Paying for It, which are uh, uh, Chester's most recent graphic novels. Oh, yeah, I have mine, too. <laughs> and then also Paying for It. Both, like, tremendously funny, made me laugh, made me cry, and had actually very important um, insights uh, in his in notes in the back. And I really enjoyed them all. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, maybe. Oh, we're going to be recording until Peter rescues you. Okay. <laughs> okay. And thank you, Peter and Camille. Oh, yes. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how this thing operates. Yeah. <laughs> this is Chester's first time on Zoom. Yes. It's like his Zoom birthday. <laughs> um. Right.